Welcome, everyone, many of whom here I know and some of whom I don't. I'm so glad to see you all. Um, hang on. Welcome to the 2024 and first maybe annual uh, Inclusive Journalism Conference at Brown University. Um, I just have to find my notes. Um, my name's Nell Lake, for those of you who don't know, and I teach journalism in the nonfiction writing program in the English department here at Brown. Um, I'm sure you all had conflicts this afternoon with this conference, so I'm very glad that you made the time to come here and, and uh, uh, explore your interest in journalism. Okay, I want to go over some housekeeping. Um, as you know, as I just let you know, the, how the workshop rosters are over there by the table. And if you haven't done so already, just before you leave, please make sure to just put a check next to your name. Um, if you have not signed up for a workshop, but you would like to, write your name on one of those lists by 4.30, and we can work out how to get you into a workshop. Um, and the schedule, if you are not clear yet on the schedule, it's on the poster that's there on the table. Basically, we'll be here for um, a good couple hours talking and listening and sharing ideas. OK, I want to do um, a land and labor acknowledgment. Brown University is located in Providence, Rhode Island, on lands that are within the ancestral homelands of the Narragansett Indian tribe. The Narragansett Indian tribe, whose ancestors stewarded these lands with great care, continues as a sovereign nation today. Brown's founding and development, and this is my own uh, labor, part of my labor acknowledgement that I often include in what I do. Brown's founding and development relied on the extracted labors of enslaved people. Its wealth has been built on this exploitation and violence. <clears throat> Uh, I had too many pieces of paper that I was keeping track of. OK. We commit to working together to honor our past and build our future with truth. I also just want to um, send out a whole bunch of thank yous to the Department of English, um, especially Ellen Viola for her careful planning and for designing of the event poster, and Aaron Fine, our department manager, also with whom, without whom this event would not have happened. Emily Hitch Hipchin and John Reddy, who's here, um, the director and associate director, respectively, of the nonfiction writing program for their support of this event. And then our sponsors, um, in addition to the English department. Charles K. Culver Lectureships and Publications, Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity, C Center for Career Exploration, the Swearer Center, the Center for Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, and I also want to give a shout out to the Black Star Journal, uh, Brown's only black student newspaper, and in fact, Rhode Island's only black newspaper, period. Um, my work with students from the BSJ, including some who are here today, thank you so much, uh, helped inspire this conference. So I'm hoping this event will help you to think about and practice reporting and writing with more discernment and skill. I also hope that it will advance your thinking about how journalism is critical to society, to both democracy and, I suggest, to social justice. Some might be uncomfortable with the idea um, that journalism is related to social justice. Uh, for doesn't social justice mean advancing a particular viewpoint? And doesn't advancing a particular viewpoint run against ethical journalistic practices? Yet. Think about it. When the journalists themselves and news organizations themselves are reporting from marginalized social, marginalized social positions, this whole question of viewpoint gets turned on its head in a way, right? It gets complicated, as we say in academia. It's this complicated picture that we'll explore today. I'm incredibly pleased to welcome these five accomplished journalism journalists and, as I learned at lunch, lovely people. Um, who will speak to questions of inclusion, of bringing the margin to the center, and perhaps of social justice. 
Ivy, were you planning on introducing people, or do you want me to do bios? Go for bios? it. OK. So Katie Barnes, you want to just uh, raise your hand? They, them pronouns covers the intersection of sports and gender. They're the author of Fair Play, How Sports Shape the Gender Debates, a fabulous book. I recommend it. Um, uh, and, at, and works at ESPN. Katie's work has appeared across multiple ESPN platforms. They've profiled women's sports superstars and rising stars alike, and they've extensively covered legislation and policy affecting transgender athletes. They're a three-time GLAAD nominee, and their work has been recognized by Folio, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Curve Foundation. In 2017, they were named Journalist of the Year by the Association of LGBTQ Journalists. Abdallah Fayyad, he, him pronouns, is a policy correspondent at Vox. He previously worked at the Boston Globe, where he served on the editorial board and the Atlantic. He also covered the George Floyd protests in Washington, DC for various outlets, um, and has appeared on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, and other networks to discuss his work and the news, and occasionally guest host, guest hosted a nightly news program on GBH, Boston's PBS member station. In 2022, Abdallah was named a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And again, my pages are messed up. Here we go. For a series he wrote on reforming the American presidency and was a finalist for the Online Journalism Award in commentary. Philip Martin, <laughs> he, him pronouns, is a senior investigative reporter for the GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting, a multi-award winning journalist. His induction into the Massachusetts Broadcast Hall of Fame was announced in February 2024. Yay. Um, Phillips Awards include the 2023 Online Journalism Awards for Social Justice Reporting, the 2022 National Edward R. Murrow Award for, GBH, for the GBH News Series Unseen, and the National Edward R. Murrow Award for Investigative Reporting. He's also been a Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard, a Pulitzer Center grantee, and an International Center for Journalist grantee, and a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. Dalila Jahari Paul, she, her pronouns, is the national editor of Capital B, a local national nonprofit news organization that centers black voices. Before Capital B, Dalila was at CNN, where she, was most, where she mostly led the race and equality team for the, di for the digital team. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Um, a veteran journalist, Dalila previously oversaw the C CNN's overnight news coverage for di digital. She's a New York City native um, who has led editorial teams and has held multiple positions at The Guardian US, The Star Ledger in New Jersey, and The Hartford Current in Connecticut. Her first reporting assignments started as a high school student covering homelessness and race relations in New York City's five boroughs. And finally, our own Ivy Scott, she, her pronouns, will be our facilitator for today. Ivy graduated from Brown in December of 2022 and is now a reporter on the Globe's climate team focused on changes individuals and institutions can make to build a more sustainable future. She previously worked as a criminal justice reporter at The Globe. Also while at The Globe, she co-hosted a mini-series on the Love Letters podcast, covered the mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, and briefly met Princess Kate. <laughs> Before this, she freelanced for the Providence Journal and worked in a year-long investigation into Rhode Island's opioid epidemic, which was featured on the public's radio. So please welcome our speakers. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, one more uh, bit of business is our questions are going to be done on three by five cards today. So Professor John Reddy is kindly going to pass those out. And anytime you have a question, write it down. If you have more than one, write, write them all down. And we'll just kind of keep, we'll make sure we've collected them all by the time we have our Q&A. Thanks so much, everyone. Hi, everybody.
everybody, welcome. Um, my name is Ivy, um, as Nell so kindly mentioned. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we jump in. Um, so I'm gonna spend probably about 45 minutes to an hour chatting with our lovely panelists. Um, in that time, if you have questions, feel free to write them down on the cards. Um, I will let you guys know when we're sort of nearing the end. So um, if you wanna sort of keep track of all your questions on the same index card and then pass them down at the end, feel free to do that. Um, or if you fill up your index card and you need another one, um, that's totally fine. Professor Reddy will have some more. Um, I will just start um, by asking each of our panelists, and I'll, I'll start with Dalila and go down. Um, if you could just tell everybody uh, one more time your name, how long you've been in journalism, uh, and when was the moment when you first noticed that your identity was playing a role in your storytelling. Um, so I can start. Uh, my name is Ivy. I've been in journalism. We'll say it's four years. Um, I was a, mostly a student for uh, the three years before that, when I when I first started freelancing for the Providence Journal, um, and I graduated in uh, 21. So if um, you were here then, maybe you saw me. If you weren't here, I don't know if anyone was here then. Maybe you've never seen me. Um, <laughs> but I would say the moment I first noticed my identity playing a role in my storytelling um, was in 2020, um, and I got tapped um, actually by the Globe's opinion team um, to work uh, part-time as a contract worker, uh, gathering stories uh, from across the country. It was mostly focused on the East Coast, but um, we took sort of a national lens, and the idea was to try and sort of fill the Globe's opinion pages with as many um, different black perspectives as possible. Um, and it was a really interesting moment where I realized that um, the lived experience that I'd had was actually very necessary to generating questions and having those conversations. And I was able to, to touch on topics and ask questions that I don't think I would have had I not just been the person that I was having lived the life that I did. Um, and so I think that was the first time when I began to see how um, sort of our backgrounds are not something that we put away and check at the door when we come to work and do this kind of um, job, but how those things actually really need to, to come with us sometimes. So I'll pass it over to Dalila. Good question, making me date myself. So I'm Dalila, I've been in journalism for, I guess 20, 23 years almost. So my first day in the newsroom was actually right after 9-11, like that September. So yeah, I've been in the game for a bit. Um, when did I notice my identity played a role? It's weird, I think it's always been really authentic for me, but I, so my, so my first job was at Newsday. I was like in a program for people of color, for editors. And I remember I had raised a question um, based on someone who was from Queens, was grew up in a really diverse, you know, black, you know, black Latino community. And I had raised a question. But what was disheartening was that one of my editors, who was a black man, um, I was really shy then, but he, gave me advice about how I should check my tone and being black, how I have to make white people feel comfortable. And that was a really jarring thing for me to hear at 23 years old. Um, but I think it set the tone for, I think, the next 10 years of how I moved in a newsroom where I would almost like self-edit myself when I would ask questions. And I think, I didn't realize the damage that it had done for a long time. So. Yeah. That's OK. Um, hello, my name is Katie Barnes. Um, I have worked in journalism since August 2015. Um, and for, that, for the entirety of my time in journalism, I've spent it at ESPN. Um, something that Delilah just said that really spoke to me about um, your experience in the newsroom at Newsday, I think for me, um, my identity has always been present and I'm of the opinion that um, in journalism, though folks don't always like to hear it, um, I think we put a lot of this discussion on people who hold marginalized identities, but the reality is, is that everybody has a lens and forcing marginalized people to strip themselves of our lens doesn't mean that the work is quote unquote objective, it just means it's in service of the dominant lens. Um, and so that 
is something that I wish as an industry we would talk more about, um, that yes, my identity informs everything that I do because it is who I am, and also that is true for white people, cis people, um, for heterosexual people, et cetera, the, those who sit at the intersection thereof. Um, like the perspectives that we have that are formulated by the experiences that we have that are fused with our identities shapes everything that we do um, when it comes to journalism, and I think probably generally, um, it's not just something that rests with those of us who sit at particular intersections. Uh, my name is Abdullah. I've been in journalism uh, about seven years now. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly one particular moment um, th that I realized my identity, um, you know, or I approach stories oftentimes uh, through my identity. But I, I think one thing that early on I experienced, um, which I think a lot of uh, black and brown people will experience when they go into journalism, a lot of LGBTQ people, anybody who, uh, a lot of women to white women even, um, will feel, so long as you're just like not a, a straight white man, is um, when you enter these spaces, particularly if you're working for a legacy publication, you will more than once um, kind of hear somebody dismiss a story idea of yours or even just kind of your career path of, you know, have you thought about activism or have you thought about advocacy work instead of journalism? Because it sounds like the things that we're interested in, the stories that we want to write are a bit too um, activisty. Um, and uh, you know, I was like, no, this is <laughs> this is what I want to do. Uh, I think these are legitimate, objective stories, um, and you know, eventually I got to do them. Um, but I think one one time in particular where I think um, in, in, a, in a story that I wrote, um, though it's it's true in a lot of my reporting because I cover policing and I cover uh, uh, criminal justice more broadly. Um, but when I was covering the George Floyd protests and seeing kind of police interactions. Uh, with the protesters uh, in DC, uh, which was at the time, um, is, especially in the early days, is uh, like the most chaotic of the protests outside of Minneapolis because um, Trump was president and deployed all of the federal law enforcement agencies. So there was just heavy, heavy police presence, rubber bullets, pepper spray, um, tear gas, all this stuff, and it was it was. In, it was total chaos. It felt like a war zone, and I don't say that um, as it, to exaggerate. It really was. There was curfew. The city was empty. Um, but seeing the way that the police interacted with the protesters was very familiar to me because I grew up in Jerusalem as a Palestinian under occupation. And what was kind of shocking to me was that just kind of witnessing the tactics that American police was using against Americans was incredibly familiar to me as how Israeli police and Israeli military used against Palestinians. Um, and the reason that was kind of such a jarring picture was because, yes, I was used to that kind of law enforcement. Um, but in my experience, that was law enforcement against what we perceive as enemies. It was, it was they viewed me as an enemy and I viewed them as my occupier, but th I did not view them in service of me, that, you know, um, they were in service of their state and I was, I was the threat. Here, the reason it was drawing was because it was American police officers policing Americans, you know, essentially the people uh, paying their paycheck, um, and yet using the same tactics. And, you know, so I wrote a story about kind of the, the, those similar dynamics and just how, you know, flawed policing was, where, you know, as, as terrible as it was, you know, in, in Jerusalem, and, you know, in, in, in many ways, you know, Worse, um, the the reason here, uh, you know, it was it was so, just so jarring and kind of eye opening was because, you know, who is this police protecting themselves from? At least that when I was in Jerusalem, I was like, they're just trying to protect themselves from me because they think I'm I'm going to be a terrorist. Um, obviously, that's not true, but that's what they think. So, wh what are these police officers actually thinking? So that's I realize that in in covering race and covering policing, my own experience growing up in Jerusalem has actually helped me better understand these systems of power and systems of oppression and the connection between the two. And you look into it and you, you realize that there is a lot of connection. A lot of our police enforcement actually gets training from the Israeli military. Um, th there, there's, there's actually a lot there and, and my identity kind of helped me actually better understand the broader story rather than just um, you know what was happening right there in the moment.
Oh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, echoing all my colleagues, uh, identity is central. It's central to my journalism unapologetically uh, and has been um, for years. And my journalism, um, I'm the uh, senior person obviously here on the panel. My journal, journalism has been divided into various uh, chapters, if you will. Um, as an intern uh, journalist at uh, the acclaimed WBCN Radio in Boston, which was a rock station in the, uh, in the 70s, and well uh, known as a iconoclastic uh, for many reasons. It, uh, essentially, folks who had been in uh, uh, the movement against the war in Vietnam uh, had some episodes of the civil rights movement had gravitated over to WBCN. Uh, so it, though it was a Boston-based station, it had a national and international reputation. Uh, so I interned there, uh, later worked at a uh, black radio station, WILD. I'll tell you some stories about that one day when you have time. Um, and uh, then for, um, I worked uh, at a CBS station, WEEI. Then I left journalism. I uh, finished uh, graduate school, uh, uh, did work at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, finished my work there. So my focus was on international law, international development. I worked for Oxfam America for years, heading up communications uh, and, uh, uh, and working in a number of places. One place I ended up toward the end of my career at Oxfam was about 10 feet from where Nelson Mandela was delivering a, um, uh, a press conference uh, just a month before the historic election that ended apartheid officially uh, in South Africa. And while sitting there amongst journalists, uh, I've, again, at that point, I was not in journalism. I had um, retreated from journalism. I wrote a uh, commentary. Uh, the Senate to NPR, they picked it up. And then for a whole year, I wrote commentary for NPR. And then subsequently was called by um, a new program that was started by the BBC, WGBH, uh, and P PRI. Uh, called The World. Uh, now, if, I don't know if you've heard it, it's uh, hosted still these days by a good friend of mine, Marco Worman. And uh, I worked as a senior producer for The World for a number of years before being uh, heading to NPR, National Public Radio, as their first race relations correspondent, uh, race and uh, ethnic conflict. Uh, I worked there until from uh, 1998, after finishing a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard, to um, uh, roughly uh, 2001. 2001 is pivotal because I was in South, I was in, uh, South Africa um, again in 2001, and it was August, and then it was September, and a story I was going to run. And, GPS signal lost. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fantastic. Uh, and let's see if we can turn this off. Okay. Um, I'm is that right? <laughs> so wrap this up. Um, and so anyway, from uh, then I worked uh, as a, uh, went from working as a, a reporter at NPR to working as a senior supervising uh, editor on NPR West, uh, but wanted to work desperately at investigative reporting. That opportunity opened at GBH when it started its newsroom in 2010. And I've been uh, working as senior um, investigative reporter at GBH since then. Uh, again, as I start this off by talking about identity, uh, identity is central. Uh, my identity is not just about race, and it's not just about color, pigmentation. It's class. It's my neighborhood in Detroit, uh, big Detroit sports fan, which is strange when you're in Boston. Uh, but it is central to uh, my identity. And identity uh, filters into everything we write, whether we do so consciously or not, or know so consciously or not. Identity fil uh, filters into everything. And we'll talk about that more. I'm going to hand this over to our moderator. Thank you so much. Um, 
so the next thing I wanted to ask you about, and, and Nell touched on this a little bit in her introduction, um, but about, you know, for anyone who has taken uh, a journalism class, anything resembling a journalism class, um, I'm sure at some point in time you've had to have that conversation about objectivity and it's important to be objective and what does objective mean? Um, and I'm wondering, and I, I'm curious just because of the um, sort of diversity of roles we have here, if people could sort of speak to this um, as a reporter, as an editor, as a columnist, um, whether you think that news organizations have an obligation to present both sides? Um, and sort of where do we draw the line uh, between objectivity and, and justice and fairness? You know, there are ways I think I've learned um, in my time reporting that we can be fair and just, and that might look a little bit different from what a professor tells you that objectivity means. Um, so I actually, for this one, I'm going to start with Katie, and then we're going to go down and loop back around to Dalila. We'll take the mic back. Oh, buddy, OK. Um, I think, so my perspective on this is really shaped by reporting on um, a, a topic that I think is fair to say is controversial, um, or at least often driven by controversy and how it's discussed in public, uh, meaning transgender athletes. Um, and for me, coupled with what I said earlier about how everybody has a lens and everybody has a perspective, and so do news organizations. Um, you know, it's less about a responsibility of quote unquote reporting both sides. Um, I think oftentimes we present this like fallacy of one side versus another side. Um, and for me, it's more about like, if I'm reporting on a topic that is controversial, by definition, it has multiple perspectives. So if I am missing perspectives from my reporting, it's an incomplete story. Um, but what's important is about gathering those perspectives and presenting them in context, um, as well as making sure that their perspective is communicated accurately to of the reader. And so what I mean by that is that sometimes, you know, if you're in a position where as a reporter, you're seeking balance, like, oh, I need a counterweight. Um, for me, the nature of the counterweight is incredibly important. So if I'm doing reporting about transgender athletes and I'm looking at legal cases and I have the perspective of the ACLU, which has a very particular perspective, um, the counterweight to the ACLU is not an unknown um, really right-wing conservative organization that is ultimately a Facebook group, right? Like, and then elevating them to that level. The counterweight is the Alliance Defending Freedom, who they argue, uh, they argue against each other in court. And the Alliance Defending Freedom is an organization that some have said and continue to say is a hate group. They argue in front of the Supreme Court, right? Like, I'm not platforming them. They have sponsors. They have written a lot of the legislation that has been passed around the country that does restrict and uh, will target transgender girls. I think that's fair to say. Um, and so for me, I have to call them. And it's very important that they take my call. And if they don't take my call, I can't do my job. Um, and that is something that I fundamentally believe in um, as a journalist and as a reporter. Because if I'm missing the perspective of any, I mean, really of anyone around the topics that I report on, um, then my story is incomplete. Um, and therefore is doing, it's not doing the service of the public that I would want it to do. Um, and so that's kind of how I think about it. Um, less about, quote, being objective and more about fairly representing the discourse as it is happening. I just want to jump in with a quick follow-up question before we move on. You talked about the story being incomplete if you're sort of missing um, that that fair and appropriate counterweight. If you are in that situation, what do you do? Do you not run the story? Do you figure out like another voice to get sort of how do you resolve that dilemma? I think it depends of, on the nature of how I, why I can't get it. If I can no longer get... Um, the, per the perspective of, well, I'll just use the Alliance Funding Freedom because I've already been there. If I can no longer get that perspective and I had been able to get it previously because they don't trust me, that's a fundamental professional issue that I have to deal with. And that may mean that it's time for me to move on from the beat that I'm on. Um, and that's something that I think about a lot, um, especially, Nell mentioned my book. Like, I take a position on the topic in my book. I dedicate 
3,000 words to it. And so if, and I knew that when I was going to do that, it may complicate my life professionally. It actually hasn't, which is interesting. Um, we could talk about that another time. Uh, but I think it depends on the nature of why I can't get someone. If somebody isn't responding to me, then I need to find another avenue, right? Like there, if I can't get a particular ACLU lawyer, well, is there another one that will do? Um, if I can't get a particular legislator, is there another one that will do? Um, is there public comments? So like I had some leftover material from an old interview with Lois Colcourse, who's a senator from Texas, um, and I wanted to use it for my book, but she had not previously given me that interview for that context. When I asked her to, to let me use it, she said no. And I said, okay, bet, I will just watch five hours of testimony from the Senate from 2017 because they archive it all. And I will pull exactly what I want from that. Um, but those are public comments. So it's like it's solving a problem. It just depends on the nature of the problem that you have in terms of not being able to fulfill a specific need in your story from a source. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, I mean, you know, I think we can talk about objectivity for hours because objectivity means something different to almost every journalist, every newsroom, and oftentimes, uh, you know, it's confused with neutrality, and that it's it's not being objective doesn't mean being neutral. So, this question about you know whether you have a duty as a journalist to you know do this uh, give the same uh, you know uh, column space to. <coughs> Uh, you know, the, both sides of a story. Um, you know, it's true. This idea that there are both sides, is, it's, it's, there isn't just like two sides to every issue, but there's like, you know, a spectrum um, of ideas and thoughts. Uh, but, you know, there, the, the, I think our job as journalists is to, I mean, I, I think objectivity is a good standard, but be kind of um, under, like, try to figure out what that actually means. And that means to be fair to the subject that you are covering. And I think that's like the North Star that we should always be focused on is are we being fair? There's this misconception that having an idea, having an argument, having a, a bias of a sorts, and even advocating for something, say in an op-ed, like I, I used to write opinion pieces, um, makes you not objective. But that's not true. You could totally write an objective column. Like I could write a piece uh, an, an objective piece about the reasons why women should vote in a democracy. And that will not be particularly controversial in this day and age. Maybe in some circles in this democracy, some people might find that controversial. But the fact is that that can be very, that's still an opinion, and it's still very much objective, rooted in evidence, rooted in like, you know, uh, democratic ideals, rooted in a collective ideal that we have as a society that we're writing in. So, you can still be objective and opinionated at the same time. You just have to make sure that you are being fair. And one of the reasons, um, you know, like and I think about this a lot as an opinion journalist. You know, one of the reasons I, I like opinion journalis journalism a lot is because you know readers generally have a good sense of whether or not a, a story is biased, and you there's bias all over the place like you know like, like you were saying earlier you know like everybody has like there there's a perspective to to everything you know even the new york times has an ideology you know even the washington post does <laughs> and um you know like say, say for example it's not really controversial to support the first amendment um in these newsrooms but that's totally an opinion and that is totally an ideology that we have to say that we support the first amendment free speech and free press and all this stuff but we're choosing to say that that's okay that that's apolitical but it's not it's not apolitical um it's it's a it's inherently political to support these ideas but we've decided that they're they're kind of apolitical but going back to to the opinion journalism aspect of this is Readers have a good sense of if something is biased, and the, the benefit of opinion journalism is that you start off your piece by telling your readers what your bias is. You're being explicit about it. You're saying, I believe X, and your job is to show them why you've reached that conclusion. So when they come out of that piece, they might still disagree with you, but they can't accuse you of being biased because you told them you're biased. What they can accuse you of is whether or not you're being fair. 
And that's what you have to try to do is like, is this argument or is this idea that kind of is an inconvenience to my argument, is it actually being made in good faith? Is this an, a, a good faith argument that I actually want to include and then dissect? Because if it is, I really should include it to show the reader that I'm being fair and that I've thought about these things and still reach the conclusion that I am, uh, I did. And so I think that's kind of the standard that it's not just for opinion journals, but anybody is just to keep asking yourself whether or not you're being fair to the other side that might, you know, or kind of these questions that your overall piece might raise, just whether you're fleshing out those ideas enough in front of your readers, what I would say. Yeah, I'll just jump in with a, with a quick anecdote before we pass it along. I think a hallmark um, of all good journalism, but uh, this includes, and I think for some people this is a surprise, um, including opinion journalism is really good research. Um, I have written exactly one editorial, one op-ed in my journalistic career, um, and I remember feeling very ill-qualified to write it. It was about a like, super uncontroversial topic. It was about uh, advocating for kids to have more places to play in the summer. So. I don't think that anybody's going to be like, boo, children. Um, <laughs> but um, when I said about writing the piece, my editor was like, no, like you need to call some child psychologists. Like You need to call some urban design experts. Like You need to get the research on why this is a good idea. And so even for something that seems, might to you seem very obvious, like you, you know, we want to remember that like things seeming obvious is a direct result of our lived experience. And so for your audience, whoever they are, to be able to <laughs> understand where you're coming from, regardless of whether they agree with you, the research is absolutely essential. So that'll pass it along. All right. Thank you. You asked the, it's a good question. Uh, and both my colleagues have great answers. Fairness is key. Um, I throw the notion of objectivity um, back to you. Uh, what is objective? It is uh, quite often subjective, uh, but it shouldn't be. Uh, the, the objectivity, it should be, uh, like Plato said, you know, if a tree is a tree, you know, a rock is a rock. You should be able to ascertain that. But today, we're dealing with um, an extraordinary number of um, situations where disinformation and misinformation have been confused with reality. Thus, you have not thousands of people, but millions of people who believe that the election of 2020 was stolen because someone said it was stolen. You have someone like Kellyanne Conway, uh, an advisor to Donald Trump, telling people that there is alternate reality, uh, as though we're in a alternate universe. But that when she first said it, it was assumed that, oh, this is a joke. But lots of people have come to believe that there's an alternate reality, that we live in two different worlds, where one world where, we, where people, uh, a president was elected in 2020, and another a world where he stole the election. I say that because the world of objective journalism uh, taught in journalism schools uh, for, for decades, the reason it's being looked at very differently now is because of this, uh, this notion of both sidisms. A lot of people believe both sidisms, and this has become common, thankfully, is not the way to do journalism. As my colleague here said, fairness is the way to do journalism. Herbert Gans, a sociologist, wrote a book called Deciding What's News. And when he wrote the book Deciding What's News in the 1970s, even then, objectivity had to be questioned because he also talked about something called agenda setting. If you set an agenda and you decide what to cover and what not to cover, what to exclude and what to include, those are decisions that militate against objectivity. <laughs> that uh, because you have basically decided that this situation is not worth covering. So if you see a situation in a neighborhood where a lot of homes in a blighted neighborhood are covered with flowers, and I saw this in many uh, parts of Detroit, blighted neighborhood, but you see where people take care of their homes, and so on and so forth. But the story you have written is that every home in that neighborhood is blighted. That's not objective. But yet people were talking about that as an objective situation 
at one point because that was their observation. Their experience was of whatever their experience was, through their eyes, this was a blighted neighborhood. Somehow or another, they did not see the flowers on the porch. Somehow or another, they did not see the gardens around those homes in those fields now abandoned in parts of Detroit. And so you have to, when you're talking about objectivity, you have to talk about also agenda setting. What, who sets the agenda? What is covered and how it's covered? That becomes part of this discussion. It's also the part of this discussion uh, is about both sideism, something that is problematic for forever, but particularly prob problematic now. I'll conclude by saying this. I covered a story, I'm working on extremism among other social justice issues that I'm focused on these days. I, just in 2022, I wrote a, a long form piece that was picked up by quite a few people, including Rachel Maddow uh, at MSNBC, who, and we talked about this. It was, it was called, It Can Happen Here. And this was about the rise of the Nationalist Social, Socialist Club, which is a neo-Nazi group in New England. And even in writing that story, I reached out to NSC 131, that's the name of it. Now, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't looking to get their side to, uh, to cast them in some positive light, because there's no light that can be cast on a neo-Nazi organization that you would call positive. But I did want to hear what led certain individuals in this group to join this group. I wanted to hear this. They could not, they would not respond to me, but one of their fathers did. And that became a key part of the story. You learned a lot from that. That one uh, point, so it was about, again, this was, I wanted to hear from them. And in the interest of fairness, I reached out to them, but it was also in the interest of having a good story. It's not, so fairness is not just something that's, uh, that's um, uh, it's a nice thing to have. It's great for a story when you can in fact broaden it to include those perspectives. That's my comment on objectivity. Dalila, you wanna close this out? Tough act to follow, um, <laughs> but I totally agree. Um, that word, I think about it all the time. And when I was at CNN leading this race and equality team, it was when that word objective became the bane of my existence. Mm -hmm. um, they, we have a really, really um, amazing, they had a really amazing like, like vetting system. Uh, we had, they had standards, they had what they called the row, and they had legal. But the hard part for me was when things were racist. So for example, Moms of Liberty, when the whole CRT backlash started, that was really hard for me because as a journalist for years, I always felt like history will prove the reporting that I'm pushing for as an editor now, that that's enough. And to have to sort of make space for people who spread disinformation was strange for me. And so um, I like what he said about what makes a good story. But for me, it became, even as the editor, because so to rewind a bit, I think editors have a lot of control. And early on in my career, that's what I wanted to do. Being a reporter is great. I used to love going to the community, but the editors are the ones who set the agenda. And so I wanted to be at the table, and I found that I usually was one of the only people. At CNN, I was the only black senior editor on digital, which to me made no sense in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think part of the discussion needs to be about even the leaders have to be honest about what they believe. The leaders have to be honest about their own biases. And so oftentimes, as editors, like we have to have those real discussions about where we come from, how we view things, because I think when people say it's objective, it's actually not. You know, in my career early on, most of my bosses were white men and white women who had never been to like a black neighborhood. And so if you have no experience with other people, 
how are you really objective? Because you're making a decision based on ignorance. And so, again, I don't know if I, you know, if I answered the question for you, but it's like, that's a hard word. I don't know if you can be truly objective in the traditional sense of how they define objectivity, but you do have to lean into being fair, having a good story, having a rich story. Even at Capital B, where I am now, where we center black voices, I still do push the reporters to reach out to some of the players that have done harm to communities. So, but I also don't give equal space to the ignorance of people. And, you know, but again, there's power in being an editor. Like, yeah, like, because again, at my former job, you know, I remember that, that, that there were key decisions where if the top boss believed something, that did define our coverage. And so being objective, I don't, I didn't always believe that we were objective. So. Yeah, no, that's really good. And it is reminding me um, both what you said and what Philip said um, about what will probably remain the craziest, if not like one of the craziest stories I've ever covered. Um, this happened last year, I wanna say in the summer or fall. Um, there was a face-off in downtown Boston uh, between the Temple of Satan um, and this uh, neo-Nazi group um, that Philip was talking about. Um, and it was a weekend, and so on a weekend, um, we're a little bit short on editors. Um, and so there's like a team of maybe three editors who work the weekends. And I remember there was like an intense conversation that I was not involved in as like the lowly reporter, but I remember sort of hearing the editors discussing like, do we even wanna give page space to this? How many words we wanna to devote to this? If we're gonna write about this, is this gonna be a quick 400 thing? Are we gonna put this on the section front? Um, and so it was just interesting to even like observe those conversations and and hear them sort of decide about like, you know, what does it mean to, to elevate this group of people? And like, what is the line between uh, wanting to acknowledge that this happened? Because obviously like that's an insane thing to, to transpire in a city, uh, certainly a city like Boston's, um, but really, really any city. Um, and so we ended up writing about it. I ended up chasing said white supremacists on the T, um, which is Boston subway system. Um, and it, it ended up being uh, like a medium length story. And I think it ran on the inside. Um, but to your point, I think that who, who is in the room really matters because even my editor was a very nice um, white woman, but on Monday when I saw her, I, I mentioned to her, I was like, yeah, it was really just sort of strange and ironic. It was me and uh, one of our two black photographers that were on this story and she sent us like chasing them into the suburbs. And I, and I told her that she was like, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't really think about that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that, that's, you know, just good, good food for thought for next time about just sort of like who, who we send into those environments. And there's like all kinds of safety concerns and things like that that come along with it. But um, it is very true that a lot of those decisions are, are made at the editorial level. Um, I want to turn now to talking a little bit about audience. Um, I think that this idea of like who we are writing for, who we think we're writing for and our actual readers, um, does a lot, um, and there's a lot of, of interplay between that and sort of the way that editors might consider framing their stories, um, the kind of external or even internal pressure they're getting to write stories a certain way. Um, and so we're gonna start at the end and work up this way, but my question for you guys is, uh, if you feel aware of who your audience is and whether or not that influences um, the way that you write your stories or how you tell them. Oh, no, yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, public radio, so we have a public radio audience, but also public radio is pretty diverse these days. We, um, our website is as important as what you hear on the air. A lot of what you hear on radio these days, you don't hear on radio. You hear it streaming, or you hear it in podcast form, so on and so forth. So we're thinking of pretty much everyone, but we know, of course, and seeking, public radio has long been seeking a younger audience, and realize that, um, that to seek a younger audience, you have to diversify, you have to modify. Thus, the web, we have uh, a big presence on YouTube, we have a major presence on TikTok these days, 
Uh, and we, uh, of course, continue with, with radio. So we're thinking about a broad audience, but also reaching out to, um, to young people, increasingly trying to bring in more people of color uh, into public radio to listen to GBH and to listen to national public radio. Uh, these have traditionally been college-educated uh, so-called formats uh, in which people who are largely uh, uh, educated uh, parts of the population have essentially gravitated toward NPR or GBH. And what GBH has been doing specifically with a lot of success has been reaching out to communities of color in Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, Blue Hill, uh, as well as Chinatown, as well as uh, Quincy, uh, with a large Asian population, as well as uh, low, tr uh, making, trying to make inroads into the Laotian and Cambodian populations there, as well as Latino populations in um, other parts of the state, including um, uh, areas, of, including Lawrence and Holyoke. We have a, a huge signal. Uh, so I hope this answers your question, but the main thing, again, is trying to reach um, folks with th the most urgent of news right now. And a lot of our news, like uh, my colleagues, a lot of it centers around th this belief that democracy is on the edge. Um, and it manifests in a lot of ways in terms of reproductive rights issues uh, that, we're, uh, that are under uh, assault. We have a lot of stories about that. We have stories about migration and what that really means, and try and not feeding into the um, the cliches, the stereotypes, the disinformation, and the misinformation about migration. Uh, trying to bring the facts of migration, and, and the facts are brought, base are are best communicated through voices, through people on the ground uh, in communities where you f where, for example. You're finally finding lots of, um, of Haitian and Venezuelan um, uh, immigrants who are coming into Massachusetts, like in New York, uh, like in Chicago, certainly across Texas. But we're also uh, focused on population groups you might not be aware of who are coming into the, into the country, from South Asia, uh, Indian populations, uh, coming, uh, also coming across the border and coming through, through, uh, through Canada. And so we are, uh, so again, we're, po we're focused on different population groups and have even hired, um, uh, I mean, have even put on forums at GBH in our studios, uh, one dealing specifically with the issue of caste, casteism in the context of South Asia. We have uh, had a forum on uh, the assaults on Asian Americans uh, Asian hate that was occurring across the country still is. Uh, so, again, I, I think to you know, answer your question, otherwise I'll go on forever, is that we are essentially trying to bring in an audience to focus on the critical issues of the day, of the moment, and that audience includes people who are part of that story, as well as people who are listening in. Um, yeah, I think this is a this is an important question. I think um, the trick is y you always have to find like the right balance, strike the right balance of of thinking about your audience because it is true that say if I was writing a, an article about what's happening in Gaza now to, uh, for a Palestinian paper, I would write it probably very differently than how I would in a U.S. paper because they f know the fundamentals. I don't have to explain a lot um, uh, of background that I would for an American audience. So when I'm thinking about like who's going to read this, that's important in shaping the story and also understanding how granular you have to be, um, you know, so that because ultimately what you want to do when you write a story is not leave anybody behind. That anybody that picks up the story can read it start to finish and get something out of it. And you don't want to, um, you know, you're essentially translating complex ideas to the layperson. You know, that's, that's our job. And so um, you do have to think about your audience that way. But then it becomes a trap. You don't want to overthink, um, like, who your audience are especially if you work at a publication that's like a mainstream publication uh, like where I do because uh, you know I would say our audience is probably 
you know, it might be more diverse, quote unquote, from say like the New York Times, but the reality is it's still going to be upper class, maybe left of center, uh, white suburban people um, is probably where the largest chunk of our audience is. And I don't want to be, you know, thinking about the stories that, you know, only they want to read. I also want to be writing stories that um, anybody wants to read and come into the uh, our website as well. So you, you don't want to over tailor kind of the kind like your 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 ideas and stories to whatever audience you already have. You want to keep pushing your audience and exposing them to stories that they think they might not be interested in. But hey, there's this pool of people that isn't your audience yet that might become your audience if you start writing those stories as well. So it, I think it's just a matter of finding that right balance of just making sure that you understand who your audience is, but don't get carried, don't let them uh, uh, you know, lead you into the story themselves. You know? I feel like you just took up residence in my brain and I'm a little upset about it. Um, so everything I was going to say, um, but yeah, Long story short, I co-sign everything you said. Um, and I think, you know, for me, writing about marginalized athletes, so whether it's specifically about transgender athletes or athletes in women's sports, um, more broadly than that, like it's still from a marginalized athlete perspective at an outlet that serves not just sports fans, but like hardcore sports fans. Like ESPN is sports all caps. Um, and so there is like some reality about what that audience is. And from my perspective, I both want to serve them and push them. Um, but also I think it informs the perspective that I take on stories and, and I'll use trans athletes as an example, where for me, that has to be a sports story. Like, it's not a law story, it's not a policy story, it's not a science story, although it touches on all of those things. It's about sports. And fundamentally, the audience that comes to where I work is going to be approaching this issue from a sports-centered and sports-educated question, which is, is this fair? And so I need to make sure I'm addressing that issue. or. I think sports should be segregated by sex. So why are we not doing that in this case, if you accept that argument? And so then I need to address those issues. Um, and so from my perspective, I think it just really shapes the lens that I have, um, because I don't have, the, I don't have the ability to stray from like the core perspective of what we do as a company, which is sports period. Um, it's why I can cover transgender athletes, but I don't really cover um, you know, access to gender affirming care, for example, unless it becomes something that is specific within whatever athlete story I'm telling. Um, but at the same time, you know, speaking to what you're saying about pushing your audience, you know, I did this um, profile of Lasia Clarendon, who is non-binary and plays in the WNBA. Um, and Lasia uses um, he, him, she, her, and they, them pronouns interchangeably with no preference. So writing 5,000 words, doing that was really something. Um, and there was, and also raising um, their child uh, using they, them pronouns for the baby. And there were multiple other trans people who used multiple sets of pronouns in the story. And we had to figure out how to do that. It was a really fun time. Um, and so, and do that without it being cumbersome, or too cumbersome, I should say, um, and also, like providing a thousand exit ramps for for the reader, um, and one thing I'll say about it because it is kind of funny, is that Ben Shapiro was upset about it and he he did not tag me thankfully, but he screenshot the lead to the piece and was like, oh this is so ridiculous, and if you read the comments, it's most of his readers going, I mean it is rid ridiculous, but we obviously know what's being communicated, and I died, <laughs> it was very funny, um, so. Yeah, I that, think that must have felt like a success. It really did. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, this is great yeah. actually. Like I'm really I'm really happy with this. Like I will take like okay, you don't agree with what we did, but the writing is solid enough that you are very clearly following what the sentence is saying. I I would say very nice writer feather in my cap for sure. Can you actually talk a little bit about um sort of how you like 
took that approach, like what it looked like to make sure that that was not like cumbersome or difficult to read with so many characters. Because I'll just say that like the Globe, for example, every news organization has their own style guide. Yeah. And um, f- I believe for non-binary individuals, oh. we use their last name at every mention. Um, so jeez. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, 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 because that is the, the sort of the rule um, at, this organization um we definitely even when we're crafting our sentences are sort of mindful you get a lot of like referring to them as like in this case the wnba player so as to not say their last name like fifty thousand times in the story yeah okay um so i did a couple of things one i think in general i mean we kind of do this a lot it's in how i present my bio you write your name and then parentheses the pronouns and then move on and I was like, we already have a control for this because I felt like the editor, like we did an editor's note up top to explain what we were doing. And then I just, I tried it that way at first. And well, that's what we ultimately did. But one of the things that was interesting was one of my editors was like, hey, I don't know that this is going to work. And I said, why? And then she was like, well, we don't think it's clear in certain, like we don't think it's clear all the time. And I was like, okay, well, can you show me where it's not clear? And so then they showed me where it wasn't clear. And I was like, okay, well, that's an unclear antecedent. Like, the pronoun isn't the issue. The writing is the issue. So let's fix the writing, and then the pronoun is fine. Um, And so, and then I made some choices. Like, I think sometimes, as somebody who is relatively fluent and, and has a good fluidity with pronouns, like, you know, if you can switch your pronouns in a sentence, it's like, oh, look how good I am at pronouns. But that's not helpful to the person that's following the sentence. So I chose not to do that um, in terms of in paragraphs. Uh, I would, if I started with a certain pronoun, I stayed with that pronoun. Um, if I also had a paragraph where I was referring to Lasia and also the baby with a pronoun, they were never the same pronoun. So I sometimes default to they, them for lay, but if I was referring to the baby as well in that paragraph, I did not use they, them. And I would use either she, her, or he, him for Leja. Same thing if I was referring to Leja and also his wife, like I would not use she, her for Leja in that paragraph and also Jess's pronouns are she, her as well. So, so that way there's a differentiation. So it's very clear from a reader perspective that you are changing the person that you're referring to. Because it's my personal belief that readers I mean, pronouns are so, like, who knows and categorizes all the pronouns that they're reading? Like, I just don't think that is a thing that people are doing. It's when it becomes a bump in the road that they realize that something has occurred. And so I just tried very, very hard to smooth all of those bumps um, whenever and however I could. And it also helped that Sports Illustrated had done the pe- had done a piece on Leja like a month before this one and had done all of the pronouns. And so I was able to successfully argue, like, as I did it, are we just going to not do it? Like, I don't think that we should do that, um, especially when it was being communicated to me as a reporter that Leja use, uses all of those pronouns interchangeably, and so did men, a couple of the sources, too. And I was like, well, we just got to figure out how we're going to do it. Um, and we got creative, and it was fine. Very cool. Dalila? Oh, yeah. On a side note, I do wish that newsrooms had more non-binary and trans people. Because when I was at CNN, Same. it was frustrating because as someone who really wanted to understand, like we had no real expert voices or people who lived experiences. So just a side note. But audience, so one of my favorite bosses at CNN, um, I loved her. And she would always tell me that the audience is the ultimate boss. And they kind of decide. And I think on digital, we know what people want by our traffic. And so I think at CNN, a lot of it was, um, and I've been kind of a little bit more intentional the last couple of years about this, where I think at CNN, it was more about teaching people because we were such a mainstream audience. So when it came to race and how we frame stories, it was teaching. At Capital B, because the target audience is black people and there are 40 million of us in this country, and we're diverse. I think the last year, it's been kind of a work in progress of who is our audience and what works. Hmm. What does work is a good story. And so whether it's someone who is in college or someone who is my age, 
some of our best stories have been because they were just good stories. But we're still trying to figure out like who is the capital B audience because it's so broad. And I think our audience team, which is very small, we're still trying to work it out, to be honest with you. It's hard. And it, it, it's harder than I thought it would be, where at CNN, it was just more teaching, right? So I could do a story about you know, a racist. I can do a story about CRT and not be really intentional. Because I think for most black people, we know about racism. Uh, we know about disparities. So it's like, how do you tell that story in a way that my mom will want to read it. So we're always just trying to figure it out. But I think a good story, people want to read good stories. They want to read about interesting people. Can, can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. are, and are you positive your majority audience is black? I mean, That's a wonderful question yeah. because, so we, we, we did some, uh, they did a survey last year. Most of our audience, I'm told, is, is black. However, a lot of white liberals love us. So it's like, it's been really interesting to see the response to the publication because, but I know the intention is how do we bring in more black readers? So I think it's something that we're still trying to work at and it's a startup. So there is like this freedom that I'm not really used to and I've never been in a startup before. So we're gonna experiment and see what happens. But that's an excellent question because you're right. Yeah, it's like a lot of people who reach out to us or not black. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really. I just want to remind you if you have a question, we'll write it down, we'll collect them soon. And should we do what, like maybe one more? Yeah, I think it went to two more questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just going to say it's really um, very resonant what you said about how a good story will always sort of bring in an audience. Um, I think that for myself, I think very little about the Globe's audience when writing. Um, the Globe's audience, uh, and what is probably a surprise to no one, is uh, very white and very old. Um, we actually keep track of the number of our subscribers who die every month. Um, yeah, which is pretty bleak. Um, I don't work there anymore, I can tell you. We, we lose 40 subscriptions a, a week due to death. <laughs> that's that's how old um, and and it's not unique. A lot of newspapers are are like this. Yeah, yeah it's not it's not great. Um, but I say that to say that um, because of that, um, much like Philip said, the Globe um, is hyper concentrated right now on pulling in a younger and more diverse audience, um, and so that is already who I'm writing for. Um, I'm not writing um, for the audience we already have, also because um, you know we are a very large newsroom, and so there are plenty, plenty of people um, writing stories that um, elderly white people will love. Um, we like have this one um, culture writer, she's very funny, everybody loves her, but sh her target audience is white suburban women. Um, and they love her and she loves them. Um, and her, like, her stories are very funny, but like that's who they're for. Um, so I'm not trying to be a replica of her, I'm trying to reach the audience um, that we hopefully will have so that when they come, they have something to read that is interesting to them and that reflects them. Um, Hmm. Okay, I think that um, as people are finishing up their questions, um, I'm going to throw a two-part question to you all. Um, and so feel free to answer one part of it or both parts if you desire. Um, but I want to just close by asking um, if there's ever been a time when you've received pushback from higher ups on a story that you really wanted to write. Um, and, and what you did. Did you fight for the story? Like, did you have to cut the story? Um, and then related to that, is there a story, um, like a, an audio segment, a project that you've done um, that you are really proud of when you think about what it means to, to sort of push the conversation on inclusive journalism? So do you want to start us off, Dalila? Sure. Well, what I was proud of most, um, I was at CNN, and it was when um, the news about anti-Asian hate was becoming a, a, the moment. And you know, as someone who grew up in Queens, um, and I think for my own self, I growing up as a kid, I had a very complicated relationship with um, some East Asians, the racism in our neighborhoods. And obviously, as I grew up, had more friends. My, 
my world expanded. However, I didn't feel comfortable as the race and equality editor defining what our coverage should be for CNN about that issue. So I had a friend who lived, who's based in Hong Kong, she's Chinese, she was from Chicago, but we organized like this meeting of like 11 of us. And it was, you know, some on-air people, some producers, and I really wanted to understand what were the stories that my colleagues felt were not being told? What, how should we frame this coverage? And I was so proud of that. And it was the, the first time I loved my job, but I saw the, the power of my role and seeing how my colleagues did not feel included. And to have this title that gave me some kind of power and to see us having digital stories, to see us having TV packages, to have one of our anchors telling, having an op-ed about her experience. Like that really, I don't know, like it, 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 like it was like a highlight of my time there and to kind of see it in real time. Yeah, no, that's really, really good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the best things about my job and about working at ESPN, at least for me, um, is that my editors and uh, like the executives all the way up to the top of the company just trust what I say. Uh, it's a very privileged place to be in, in that regard. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think it'd be very challenging for me to, le for me to leave. Uh, the expertise that I have, not from an ex like an identity experience perspective, although that is respected, but from the way that I cover um, my beat, and in particular trans athletes is, and just queer and trans folks generally, um, is incredibly well respected. Um, and so when I pitch a story, the answer is almost always yes. Um, you know, in, in general, you know. 95% of the pieces I do I, I, are my pitches. Um, I'm very rarely told no. Um, you know, I might get edits on a pitch, and we get to where it's a place. It gets to a place where it can be greenlit. But um, you know, if I say I think we should do this on trans athletes, um, they might ask, "How is this different from what we've done before?" But never like, "No, we don't cover trans people," uh, which is. You know, that's not the case for many journalists at many outlets, and so for that I'm incredibly grateful. Um, but I think in terms of what I'm most proud of, I think it's tough, they're like all my children. Um, I think my overall coverage of not just transgender athletes as like a population of athletes, but of the legislative escalation that we've experienced in this country. Like, as a feature writer in my particular group, I don't write often. I maybe get one story about this topic a year um, as one of my handful of stories I do in a year. Um, but it is, like for me, if you look at the first story that I ever did for ESPN the magazine, which is on two high school transgender athletes, it was published in 2018, which was very early on this topic. Um, and then you look at the next one I did in 2020, and then you see it again in 21, um, and you can trace that escalation um, with, I think, the depth and the nuance that you just did not see reflected in main, in like legacy publications and in mainstream outlets at that time. Um, now I think folks have caught up a little bit, but some of that earlier reporting uh, from the initial outbreak of um, legislative targeting, um, you know, I was there, and I'm very proud of that um, because I do think, and it was something I didn't really realize the impact of, um, probably until Leah Thomas, um, the University of Pennsylvania swimmer um, who's trans, um, and when doing that reporting in 2021 and 2022, um, you know, there are a couple of events where a bunch of reporters were there, and I write about sports, and I didn't go to journalism school, 
Um, I am one of the only trans reporters in the country that has a staff job. Uh, like my experience as a journalist is incredibly isolated from pretty much most people in the field outside of sports. And sports in and of itself is a very particular isolated part of the journalism world. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm with, I think there's a CNN reporter there, and there are other reporters around who were talking to me about the issue and knew who I was when I was in that space and told me that they read a lot of my other stuff to inform their own reporting. And I'd never experienced something like that before, um, and it really showed me how impactful uh, that early reporting I did was. Um, I don't know, that is always hard to pick just one favorite. It's like when somebody asks you what your favorite movie is or something, I can I never really have an answer. Um, not that my articles are as good as movies, but hopefully one day. <laughs> um, you know, I, the, to, to answer both questions, I'll be quick. I think the first time was when I was an editorial fellow at The Atlantic. Um, it, was an, it was like my first job in journalism, a year-long kind of internship. Um, and there was a big cover story, um, you know, this big 10,000 word feature uh, about, and I swear I write about other things, but this was about Palestine. <laughs> and, um, and it was uh, assigned to uh, uh, a Muslim American writer, and it was supposed to represent kind of, you know, uh, in a magazine that has long covered the conflict from the Israeli perspective, or at least a pro-Israeli perspective, it was supposed to be this 10,000 word feature, a big space to kind of um, go through the more, uh, more of a Palestinian perspective. But the piece was so flawed in my view in, in, in so many different ways because, you know, he, you know the, the way that the writer ended up writing it was very much kind of within the narrative of this being kind of a religious war, um, you know, and, and he used his kind of identity as a Muslim to go, you know, it was, it was titled Muslim Among the Settlers, so it was, he, you know, he inserted himself in a story in, in a way that was, I thought, unproductive uh, to the Palestinian narrative. Um, and so I raised this issue and pushed back on it, um, at, you know, at, after publication <coughs> um, and ended up writing a response and ended up interviewing the guy for the, um, the, 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 the Atlantic's podcast at the time and kind of pushed back on this idea because you know he made no mention for example that there in the piece that you know there are Palestinian Christians and that the, it's not just a you know and um, and so that was a, an opportunity where the higher-ups were very open to hearing my perspective and saying okay well let's you know flesh this out more and do it publicly um, so he, write a response obviously it's you know not the same I, I didn't write a 10,000 word response but you know I got to interview the writer and have a good faith discussion about um, you know the the process, and I thought you know that was a that was a good way, and that's I hope more editors kind of have that kind of openness uh, to to criticism. The piece I would say I'm I'm most proud of, and I have a recency bias always, but it, it is also related. Um, you know after October seventh and and what's been happening in Gaza and in the aftermath of October seventh. Um, you know, I wanted to write a piece kind of contextualizing the violence and, and, you know, where this all comes from and also warning about what's to come, um, you know, in the early days because we all knew how bad this can become. And so, you know, I, I wrote this piece about my experience growing up in Jerusalem, um, the occupation I experienced and, um, you know, kind of what kids in Gaza have grown up in, um, you know, and how it's different from what I grew up in in Jerusalem, as terrible as um, it was. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote the piece quickly in a, a few days after, and the response was overwhelming, um, you know, in, in a way that made me realize this is why we do this, you know, because I, I, you know, whenever you write about this issue, you'll get a ton of hate mail and very racist stuff, really disgusting. Um, and this was no different. But the difference was that I heard from so many people from all walks of life. So, you know, the first group I would hear from was Palestinians living in the Boston area and Palestinians across the U.S. too, just reaching out, kind of thanking me for writing the story because they felt vindicated. People who have not read their story in a lot of mainstream outlets reading a familiar story and saying thank you for finally like elevating our story, you know, and like feeling this kind of happiness and relief that, you know, <laughs> they're not being gaslit to think that they are, you know, living in this alternate reality. Um, and th so that's always a good thing. But what was also heartwarming was I also heard from 
a lot of American Jews, for example, who reached out. Some of them were anti-Zionist, self-identified anti-Zionists who, you know, have been organizing and advocating in that space and told me about their journeys, about how they reached that conclusion of becoming anti-Zionist and why they're advocating in that uh, in that sphere. One of them, for example, um, one of the readers that I, I heard back from also was so excited by my article. She printed out like hundreds of copies, went to her farmer's market and started handing them out. And then I heard from another reader who said, hey, I, um, I was at the farmer's market and this really nice lady <laughs> uh, gave me this article and I felt this impulse to reach out. And then I also heard from pro-Israeli perspectives too. Um, you know, people who were, uh, you know, uh, identified themselves of uh, having the Zionist perspective that were actually respectful, you know, and, you know, they pushed back on some of the claims I made, but they also were thankful that they were exposed to this kind of viewpoint, which was new to me in writing to the, in, in this particular space. And so that, I would say, was a story that kind of pierced through in a very kind of polarizing, uncomfortable, um, you know, very painful time for so many people, and still the response to it um, from, and it wasn't just kind of in an echo chamber, the response to it was kind of heartening from all these different, you know, backgrounds. I have to ask really quick, do you respond to every, like, legitimate non hate mailing email you get? I, I try, I try my best to because you, I always feel guilty, but I, I fail to sometimes because I'm a chronic procrastinator, uh, not because I don't want to, but because I say, I'm gonna respond to this person and then like weeks pass by and I, oh, I forget. Media, but oh, no. no, no, on social media it's difficult, um, but emails are easier to, to kind of filter. But yeah, I try because you know, you, you wanna build a relationship with your readers if they're, if they're respectful, you know? Yeah, I think that's something we're all, we all have in common these days. We're all, all getting hate mail these days. Yeah, uh, uh, very seriously, I think uh, that's, that's one of the features of journalism these days, but it's, uh, it goes with the territory. Uh, the, some of the stories that uh, were, that editors pushed back hardest against uh, turned out to be my favorite stories. Uh, and the ones which garnered awards. Uh, uh, and one uh, was, when I first came to GBH um, in 2010, um, pediatric nurse um, who I was speaking with in a Starbucks, at the end of a conversation, she said, you know, something uh, really amazing happened. I got a call from a friend of mine with the state police in Rhode Island. And he said that, uh, asked me if I would, because I work in pediatrics, if, uh, if I would go into um, a, um, um, what do you call it, a uh, uh, salon, uh, a hair salon, a nail salon, and if you can ascertain uh, the, the ages of the uh, young women who are working in the nail salon. And so, so she said, well, why would she want me to do that? And she was told because of we're doing an investigation on human trafficking, and we believe there's labor trafficking that could possibly be also sex trafficking going on in some of the nail salons. And I said, you know, that's an interesting story. And of course, this is how stories start, investigative stories. I ended up trying to do this investigation and was immediately told, not by the news director, but by other people at GBH, ah, that's not a story. I said, that's a story. I said, that, that, that said if you don't recognize that as a story, how do and so I looked into it and found out that it was legitimate, that there had been uh, cases uh, in, um, in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island, where hair salons were being, uh, where young women were being exploited. And uh, working in the nail salons during the day and doing sex work at night. This turned out to be uh, the first part of a series of stories I did on human trafficking. Uh, but there was pushback against that. The second piece was even more ambitious in terms of the work we did. This is called underground trade. I'm gonna be talking about this at the, at the workshop that I'm leading. But in underground trade, this is an eight part series. We looked at the connection between Route 95 from New York into New England, l largely from Flushing, New York, into New England, and found out there were all types of tentacles, of all types of ways of bringing in, of, 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 of abetting trafficking. One was through, historically, a series of buses that were initially used. They became uh, low, they were initially cited as low-cost buses. Everyone took them, uh, including the Feng Hua bus. But it turned out that, they, that the origin, the provenance, 
was to facilitate labor trafficking. Uh, and, but anyway, this uh, was a massive pushback because the reason the pushback occurred is folks were saying, well, we're local. We're in Massachusetts. What does this have to do with us? And my role at GBH has always been to connect dots between local, national, and international. This turned into an international series, an underground trade. Uh, and it was, again, one of the pieces that, was, that they pushed back against. Another piece also happened to have an, a local, national, international character was Cast in America. This is a series uh, from th four years ago in which I f went with um, a, f a fellow named Siraj Yinde, who was a at Harvard, formerly known as an untouchable, he's a Dalit, and tried to make the connection between the discrimination the Dalits faced in the United States, juxtapose that with discrimination that black folk uh, experience. Isabel Wilkerson later did this in her book, Cast. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but this was the idea uh, uh, at the time. Massive pushback against why would you want to look at a, this thing called Cast? And by the way, said one editor, what is Cast? <laughs> that was the question. Uh, and I said, if you have to ask, but again, you know the answer to that. Uh, so, so those were two of my favorite uh, pieces, but it also uh, re re uh, involved pushback. I always fight for my stories. Doesn't matter what those stories are. It helps, of course, being having experience in journalism over the years uh, and and gaining gravitas uh, within the within public radio. That helps a lot. But even as a younger reporter, I've always fought for stories that I believe needed to be told, stories that needed to be told, voices that should be heard that were excluded. Everyone here on this panel has talked about those voices being excluded. It's imp it was imp absolutely imperative to include those voices. That is the reason why I fought and fight for the stories I do. Incredible. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to scoot my chair back um, and hand it over to Nell um, for the student questions. starter while you're oh absolutely yeah so I was very curious so Ivy I had the joy of working with you on your senior thesis if I remember you were a <coughs> independent concentrator in international journalism so I'm curious two parts and this is to everybody how did your education help prepare you for your journalistic career and how did it not help prepare you what do you wish you knew then that you know now if that, and that's to every everybody he's trying to convince you the tuition is worth it two ways so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I mean, um, that's, no, I mean, that's a great question. I had a, a great college experience, but it had nothing to do with journalism, except for in one part. I started a satire magazine at school um, with my friend, and it was just kind of like our school's version of The Onion. And it was very silly publication, but it also made me realize that I, I wanted to write, and that, like the school was the perfect environment to do that. I studied economics, which actually helped inform a lot of the writing that I do, because I do write about the economy. I write about inequality <coughs> and poverty a lot. And you know, the welfare state is something that I'm interested in, and so I cover a lot of things like healthcare, social security, housing, stuff like that. Um, 
and so you know that interest came to me from college. But I think one I was talking about this. I was talking to some students at USC last night, and um, you know I was telling them one of the things that, that's great about journalism is that your background can be from whatever, and it's good when you're in school to study things outside of journalism as well, even if you do have a journalism major, because it gives you this kind of more well-rounded approach to covering stories. And um, you know I, I think um, I, what I was saying was like. You know, uh, anybody can be a journalist, and I think that's that's a gift of our, our industry. But I think we put up arbitrary barriers to entry. So, you know, one thing that helped me um, yeah, in, get into journalism, having gone to school, wasn't the actual degree. It was just because I it was a requirement in my first job to have a college degree. But not what I st what I studied didn't necessarily matter. It got my foot in the door. But that's unfortunate because the reality is that s journalism is an education in of itself. Every time you write a story, you're calling up professors and experts and people who will explain things to you in simple terms and you learn a lot no matter how much you've covered a certain topic you learn a lot every single time you learn a story uh, you write a story and, and and it's kind of a rewarding educational experience in and of itself um, so you know I think college was um, more of the f like by virtue of it being like the formative years of my life and um, having that satire magazine inspire my writing, um, even though I, I swear I'm really not funny. Um, but, you know, that was like a, a great kind of run into journalism and writing, but I studied something entirely different and that's been its own reward as well. I can jump in next. Um, I think that for me, what was most helpful here was definitely the fundamentals. I took like an intro to journalistic writing class uh, my very first semester at Brown. Um, and I had not written at all for like my high school newspaper. I thought my high school newspaper was bad and boring, um, so I just didn't bother. Um, but I came here and was like, yeah, I think I want to be a journalist. Um, and we had to submit writing samples. Um, and the writing, uh, the prompt was something Thing about like it was like what did you do over the summer um but it was supposed to be a, like an article like a hard news story and i submitted a monologue um to the professor and she very kindly uh gave it back to me and said this is a monologue uh please take yourself out of it and then resubmit it to me um which i which i promptly did um and she nicely let me into the class um and so i think just even things about like I hadn't been reading a ton of news until I started studying journalism. And so I think even getting into the habit of reading the newspaper, like checking the major websites, um, all of that was very helpful. I think something that I wish I had learned more about um, was just how many different types of journalism there are. I think that I, um, because I like to write I'd assume like you're going to be a newspaper writer, and I am a newspaper writer. Um, but I hadn't thought about the fact that maybe I could be a magazine writer, maybe I could be a columnist, maybe I could do all of these other things, maybe I could you know go into radio. Um, and so I think that it has just been interesting since entering the field, just meeting so many other journalists and finding how many different ways there are to do this job. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to college at a small liberal arts school in Minnesota, um, and I majored in history, Russian studies, and American studies, and I have a minor in women and gender studies, which is just a lot of words to say. I learned how to connect things, um, and uh, just you know, research, um, you know, synthesize ideas and create new ideas, and for me, that really served as the fundamental. Um, it's just like it's the foundation for who I am as a journalist um, is, you know, having an education and also um, having a brain that likes to look at the connections between things and take, um, I don't know, just kind of jump around in, in different ways. And I love pop culture, so I love to bring up pop culture references. Um, I love to explain things like how we gender hormones through scenes in movies that we've seen, like things like that. Like that's what I like to do as a writer um, generally, and I bring, that, um, I bring that into my journalism for sure. Um, and for me, journalism, is just a, it's a style of writing. It's a type of writing. It also is a bit of an ethic um, in terms of like how you approach gathering information and synthesizing information and presenting that information. Um, but I and so from that sense, like 
I wish, um, <laughs> from an educational standpoint, like, I didn't know how to write a news story. Like, I was assigned a newser, <laughs> like, and I literally Googled how to write a news story. Uh, because not, I was like, well, I can write sentences, right? Like, but I was like, how do I do it this yeah, way and this format? And I didn't want to ask anybody and seem like a noob. So <laughs> I, like, did it. And, you know, in my free time and through high school and college, I wrote a lot of fan fiction, which is a story for another day. But for me, it meant, it gave me this confidence confidence. I was like, I can mimic anything. Like, whatever voice you have, like, I can 100% do that. I've been doing this. I've been training for this. And so I, uh, you're just kind of, you know, got through it. And as I learned how to write features, you know, I would just deconstruct other feature writers writing because I learned how to do that in college um, and like rip it apart and figure out, okay, how did they do this? Where did they place their quotes? Okay, that's what I'm going to do as well. Um, and until I, you know, developed a little bit more. Um, but for me, I mean, that's kind of how it worked. So I did not want to be a journalist, even though I had done, <laughs> even though I had done reporting as a as a teenager. When I went to college, I went to Rutgers. I majored in poli sci. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, hey, um, me too. <laughs> but I wrote for our black student newspaper. For whatever reason, I was always this person that didn't want to do the norm. So the Daily Talk was like the big paper at Rutgers. I didn't work for that paper. But journalism kept coming after me in a way. Um, so when I graduated, my first job was actually in TV production, kind of. And then I found the program that I called MetPro, which was for people of color to inspire diversity for reporters and also for editors. And so I did reporting for about two years but I was more of an editor. I've been different kinds of editors. I've been a copy editor, production editor, assignment editor. But I wish that I did more beat reporting early on. That's my one regret. I think that um, I was so shy in my early 20s. I was a good writer, but I just wish that I was patient enough to just cover courts or have more confidence. Um, it all worked out in the end, but I, I do wish that I did more Meet reporting. I did. Um, I, I, I did undergraduate uh, work in Detroit, Wayne State University, but I only went for two years. I actually dropped out of college. I went directly from undergraduate dropout to uh, to graduate school, uh, and I'll tell you that story one day. But uh, I won't tell it now because it's too long. <laughs> but uh, it had to do with convincing someone that I could do the work. Uh, the courses that influenced me uh, were international protection of human rights. Uh, if there was one course that influenced me, it, that one had a major impact on my journalism. I had always been interested in journalism. Growing up in Detroit, you, didn't, you not only listened to um, uh, black radio stations, but you also listened uh, across the river to CKLW. Anyone from Detroit here? Canada, anyone from Canada? Uh, and uh, we also listened to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which had a very uh, different take on things than most US frameworks of assumption uh, at that time. And so this was a totally different framework. Uh, uh, and so that was part of my education, was listening to the radio growing up. Um, as far as um, courses, uh, the other course that was very influential history courses of all sorts, diplomatic history, uh, history of scientific racism, uh, of, of t broader history of, of people's history, if you will, of the United States, the Howard Zinn uh, 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 expository. Uh, these are just very, very uh, important for my inculcation in, uh, in journalism and for uh, the work that I do, um, do today, but especially History, I always say to students, and I really believe this, that you are, it is really incomplete, whatever journalism you're doing, if you do not have a good sense of history, a knowledge of history, if it's simply Wikipedia, forget about it. <laughs> That's just not going to suffice. It has to go, you have to go a lot deeper because it has, not, it has nothing, um, or has, let's put it this way, has less to do with dates than connecting the dots. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I want to say this is a moment, one of many moments of when I'm 
pleased and proud to be teaching at Brown because you all asked fantastic questions. Um, and I'm having a really hard time deciding because it's 3.45. Um, so I'm just going to go for my one idea here, that which is I have four questions that to me make a kind of a, a nice set because they're about identity and about kind of different um, coming at identity from different identities, I suppose you could say. Um, so I found the anecdote. So what I want is you just riff on whatever these four questions kind of provoke in you. I found the anecdote on stepping back and reaching out to Asian voices regarding coverage of anti-Asian hate crimes really profound. How does discussion like this inform coverage? What makes a discussion on identity slash background like that one successful, in quotes? How do you measure that success? So there's one. Um, how has your, your reporting been impacted by tokenization? Does it ever feel like you have to be the reporter covering this story because of your personal backgrounds? At the same time, though, you want to ensure that this story is reported on is reported on through an inclusive lens. How do you deal with that burden? Um, this question was already kind of answered by Dali, D Dalila, sorry. Um, but I would love to hear from other panelists. Do you have an experience in which you've realized you're not the right reporter to cover a story? What made you realize that, and how did you grapple with that? And finally, I'm guessing this comes from a student who is in a more dominant social position. How does one responsibly and adequately report, form an opinion on, represent a story that is not part of, removed from your own lived experience? Or I suppose it could be go both ways, but is it even just to take on this story? Is it our duty to give it to someone who, with lived experience, with lived experience? Um, so I will, yeah, I was gonna say, um, I will speak very briefly and then I'll pass it along, sort of whatever speaks to you guys, feel free to weigh in. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say is that um, if people have questions for like one of us specifically or for all of us, like we'll be, we're gonna have time in the break, we're gonna have our session, so like please do not hesitate to approach us um, when, when this like formal session is over. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about um, the question on, on tokenization and um, on sort of reporting on marginalized communities. Um, and this, my workshop will talk about this a little bit, like reporting on marginalized communities that aren't your own. Um, I think that I try my best to not feel responsible to only write black things. Um, those things definitely interest me. And like I said before, I think that we have many people who are very well versed in writing about white things. And so I don't, I really don't feel any responsibility to do that. Um, so when it interests me, I don't hesitate to jump on it. Um, but I also think that it is important um, for people from privileged backgrounds, um, whether that be you know from a racial uh, perspective, from a gender perspective, whatever the case may be, um, to also be engaging with those communities. Um, I think that. Uh, a, one smart way that I've seen it done is by partnering up reporters on a story. I think that that can be very helpful, if especially um, in the beginning. Um, but I also think that it is incumbent upon um, people in positions of privilege um, to do their own research, to do their own homework, um, and to just be paying attention um, to you know what the climate is that they're stepping into, what the community is that they're stepping into. Um, and I think also going back to this conversation about um, leadership, I think it is super important to have like a diversity of editors looking at that story. Um, my first couple editors I've had uh, a lot in the two years that I've been at the Globe full time um, were white men, um, and they were very nice. Uh, but when I would write stories about the black community, I always went to a black editor in addition to my editor and said, hey, can you look at this? Like, is there anything up with the story? Is there anything that I'm missing? Anyone I should have talked to? And I think that that's important uh, for everybody um, writing about like any kind of marginalized identity to check with somebody. Um, and hopefully, ideally, you have those people in your newsrooms. You're going to have to get creative if you don't about who you reach out to. Um, but I think it really is important to have um, that check and that balance by somebody um, who isn't necessarily speaking for that community, but who can perhaps weigh in and offer insight that you might not already have. 
Can you mind if I follow up real quick? Um, I was just, yeah, really good points. Uh, the whole notion of, I, well, I refuse to allow myself to be a token anytime. Uh, that's the course, over the course of my life. It's just, that's not gonna work. Uh, there have been, of course, situations where someone has thrown a story at, at you saying that you would be best to cover that story. And I would say, well, no, I, I don't think I would. But if I think I can cover that story better than anyone else, I'm gonna grab it or, or run, uh, run at it. I give you one example. Uh, I covered a story with a, a fellow reporter at National Public Radio named Eric Welsterveld, great reporter. And we went to York, Pennsylvania to look at a racial uh, hate crime that had occurred. And we covered this is a town literally built on the, on two sides of the track. I mean, the notion of this side and this side. And one was a white side, one was a black side. Uh, and we covered the story from those perspectives. And what I liked about that is not the formula, but it was predicated on what journalism should be, which is embracing com complexity. Because we found surprises in some of the perspectives on both sides of the track that you would not uh, expect. It sort of contravened expectations and assumptions. Uh, and so I, I think that's responding to the notion of, um, of how do you get to know communities, one of the questions that was, that was asked. And I think th how you get to uh, a point in journalism where, um, where you actually get to know your subjects, if you really focus on it, you get to know these communities. You don't always just, sometimes you, sure, of course you parachute in, but I don't think you just, for example, uh, decide to cover a Latino community without having background, without having um, of, of contacts, making contacts, sourcing, so on and so forth. Uh, I did a story uh, with the, um, a series, with the ridiculous title called The Gangs of Nant Nantucket. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely ridiculous, right? But it turned out to, to be um, a situation based on the small number of members of MS-13 who, had, who, had, uh, who were preying on community members of the Salvadoran community in, um, in Nantucket, and a small number of Barrio 18 members who were preying on uh, workers in Nantucket. Nantucket needs workers uh, to build those big fancy houses. Uh, and some uh, young people f uh, also came to the island. But it wasn't really about that, because this number of people were, is so minute, uh, gang members, MS-13 and 18th Street Gang. But you also had people who had, you had a young man who pretended to be a member of the 18th Street Gang. And the police said, if you if you're going to act like you're a member of the 18th Street Gang, you are a member of the 18th Street Gang. He was arrested, put into detention, was on the brink of being deported based on, on this story. And based on our reporting, we believe uh, that uh, that de deportation did not happen. I say this because I could not have done that story. There was no one who would have spoken with me uh, in the Salvadoran community without me getting to know the Salvadoran community on Nantucket. And that took many, many weeks, about seven weeks, where I did no reporting. I just sat down and, and we shot the breeze, you know? And that was what, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, I hope that's answering one of the questions, the four questions that were asked, uh, that you have to embrace complexity. And the way to do that is you get to know those communities. You, um, uh, you get to know people in those communities. And you approach things like even the notion of community. I used the term even far back as 2001 and 1999 when I was working for NPR's race relations correspondent. I insisted on the word black communities because of the disparate number of communities. that. And there's black community in a holistic sense, of course, and in a poetic sense. But when you're talking about demographics, there are all types of black communities, as there are all types of white communities. And that, too, has to be recognized uh, in terms of, uh, for example, what I do, uh, investigative reporting. You have to quantify. Um, so, so, so sorry. We're, we're, we're almost there, huh? Mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, I just figured I'd, I'd 
you know, we have five minutes. <laughs> I was going to answer the tokenization question. Please, yes. Um, so one of the things that I grapple with um, in many respects is how my hyper specialty, um, which is about an ultra marginalized, marginalized and targeted community, of which I am part in some shape, like in some ways, um, how that has directly benefited my career. Um, and what, as a marginalized person who sits at the very specific intersection that I do, um, and who started writing about trans athletes in particular at the time that I have, and also athletes in women's sports at the time that I have, um, what that means for me in terms of how when I often am tokenized in some way, shape, or form, um, that often comes with a particular advantage or opportunity um, most of the time. And so what I mean by that is it is not often that many people in my group get to do as many television pieces as I do. And I got to get a number of those opportunities because I was literally the only person who could do them. Uh, which is great for me, um, but there's also this just active, this thing that I grapple with a lot in terms of actively profiting off of the pain of my communities, um, and also recognizing that as hard as I try, um, and as much as it matters to me, the door that I walked through as a non-binary reporter and a trans person and being <laughs> black as well, like. Nobody has come after me at my company um, in a, in a front-facing like front role. And frankly, that's true across most of journalism. Um, and that's hard um, in terms of both the responsibility that I feel to my community, in terms of doing the work that I am very interested in, naturally, um, and that I think is really important, and also that directly benefit, benefits me from a capitalistic standpoint. Um, that's a really hard thing to wrestle with. Um, I do it every day. Um, some days are better than others. Um, and also, you know, I don't only write about trans people, and sometimes it's very hard to be a trans person covering trans people um, in this particular moment, and sometimes I just like want to write about football mm -hmm. <laughs> because I love sports, mm -hmm. and so I'm like, can I write about a quarterback? How do I do that? Which I never thought I would say, you know, four or five years ago. I'm actually actively on the record saying we have enough NFL reporters. I will never write about <laughs> football, and now I'm like, cool. How do I write about football? It sounds great. Um, how can I write about F1? Please send me to Monaco. Like that is the feeling I have. Um, and so those are things that are really hard because I also would not be in a position where I could ask for some of the things that I ask for and demand certain things that I demand from a career perspective without the reporting that I have done on communities of which I am a part who do suffer every single day. Um, and I don't really know what to do with that, but I at least felt responsibility to name it in this room today. I don't want to take up time. Should I answer something or I can? Well, tokenism, that's an interesting word. I, <laughs> I was someone who never wanted to be the black voice, the black reporter, the black editor. 20 years later, I am that person. And I actually embrace it. I think um, I've sort of had to rethink what that word actually means. I used to resent it a lot. When I was in Connecticut, I was the black person. Um, but I think, similar to you, it did help my career, but I had to make peace with the reality of it because many of these newsrooms are not diverse. And so um, I think I used to overthink it a lot. Um, and when it became too much for me, I would just leave a, a place. And so once I know what the culture is in a newsroom, if it doesn't work for me, I move on. I'll be quick, I'll, I, like 30 seconds. I, my first thought was just that I thought that Gangs of Nantucket was the millionaires who don't pay taxes. Um, but the other is like based on what you've heard here is um, I think um, if uh, the question that I, 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 that stood out to me was like when, when you realize you're the wrong reporter for a story. And I think 
in, I'm, I'm of the view that there is no wrong reporter for a story. Uh, the only way you're the wrong reporter for a story is if you're a bad reporter. Um, and because, you know, part of our, like our, our trade is to tell stories and people's stories and our job is not to tell our story. Sometimes, you know, you can write a personal essay, um, but <clears throat> our job is to tell the stories of people who trust us with their stories. And if you are a sensitive, uh, good, and uh, dogged journalist, you're going to be able to tell the story well. Like Philip was talking about embedding himself you know, in Nantucket, talking to um, you know, the Salvadorian community, and just kind of getting to know them, getting them to trust him, him getting to understand their background. It wasn't, he didn't have to be Salvadorian to write that story, but he was the right reporter for that role because he actually tried, he, he was humble. You know, and I think that's that humility is what you need for a story. Your background matters in how it informs your kind of approach, but you know, I think ultimately it's it's your your kind of humanity and, and your humility. Just kind of uh, uh, know what you don't know and then be open to to learning it. Can I add one more thing? Yes, I agree with you, but I'm always skeptical sometimes. So for me specifically, when it comes to covering black communities, drug addiction. In my career, I have been suspicious of white people who are obsessed with certain communities. Mm. And I often wonder, what is the obsession? However, I had a reporter at CNN who I adored. And I think it was her humility and just curiosity, but the fact that she lived in Atlanta, the fact that she was of community was important and she did wonderful stories. And so she often challenged my discomfort, but she also appreciated me asking those probing questions of why do you care so much? Like what is the, the it's like, like what is this about? And I think that's what you should constantly ask yourself. Like why do you care so much? And I think communities do pick up on when they feel like people are like studying them. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to just ask yourself those tough questions. And, but again, so that's my response. Yes, thank you. That's really great. Dalila and everyone, thank you so much.